Greetings! In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of functions. In the previous video, we primarily focused on how to define functions and how to call them in our applications. Now we're actually going to take a step back and help us understand why functions are so important that we're dedicating two whole lessons to it, and why functions in general are a useful tool for computer scientists. As a reminder, you've been using functions pretty much since day one, we just didn't really talk about it. For example, we had you print the words hello world to the screen by writing this exact line of code. You didn't know how it worked, but you knew that if you typed print and you put hello world in a string, that would appear on the screen. Have any of you actually wondered what is actually going on behind the scenes? What code is being executed when you type print? Uh, it doesn't matter, I'm going to show you anyways. Uh, here's the code for it. Actually, I'm lying. Here is the code for it. So uh, Python actually publishes all the code that they use in order to uh, make things work. This is the print function. It goes down a ways. Yeah, this is more lines of code than you will probably need for the final project. Uh, all that code just to make something print to the screen. So it turns out that print's not the only one that's deceptively uh, complex. You know, if you think about software systems in general, there's a lot of lines of code that are happening behind the scenes. Windows XP, which was the 2000 version, that had 40 million lines of code. The F35 had 23 million lines of code in 2013. It's got lots more now. And Facebook you know, is at 62 million and counting. And there's probably a lot more lines of code since uh, this slide was made a year or so ago. No programmer no matter how nerdy they are and how wise they are, is going to write 40 million lines of code. So no one sits down and says, I'm going to make Windows. Instead, they say, I'm going to focus on a small problem, like maybe make the start button, you know, draw that on the screen, and then we build up from there. So we take the, the big system we want to build and we break it down into small pieces, and then we implement each of those separately. That's basically functional decomposition. The idea that we take the big problem, we identify our high-level task, we break it down into smaller tasks, and we keep doing it until we have a piece that's small enough that we can hand off to a programmer for them to write. And usually it's written as a function. And when it's all done, we bring the functions back together. So I just want to show you real quick here. Uh, this is an example of the Lunar Lander project, which was assigned to cadets in 2019 as their final project. And here's what it looks like. Um, you see the little, little lunar lander has some randomly drawn terrain and then the little lander has thrusters and basically your options are that you can land on that green pad over here or you can crash into the ground. Crashing is more fun. So, And then that's it. That's the game in a nutshell. Uh, when I showed this to cadets and I said you need to build this, you know, you get that glass-eyed stare of I don't even know where to start. And that's kind of the point, right? This is a fairly complicated system. There's a lot of pieces to it. So we tell them not to look at this whole program at once. You probably can't draw the whole game. You can't, probably can't implement the whole game. But you could probably draw the lunar lander, right? So if we go down to the code for drawing the lunar lander, it's actually not that much, right? It's only about 10 lines of code to make it happen. That's not too bad. Right? And then the same thing for drawing the ground. It turns out that drawing the ground is really easy. There's only a few lines of code for that. So um, when the students started working and building these small pieces, once they were all done, at the end we had them put all the pieces together. So we had them draw the terrain, and we had them draw the lander, and then we had this other function that made the lander move. And basically, and we'll talk about this more when we do loops, is that these three lines of code are all that the Lunar Lander game really is. It's just drawing, uh, moving, and then doing it again. Drawing and moving over and over and over. The other thing we want to talk about in this lesson is the idea of abstraction. When we introduce the concept of the print function, you know, you don't need to know how print works. In fact, it's probably not even a good idea for you to look at the details because it's easy to get overwhelmed by them. So with abstraction, what we're essentially trying to do is we want to have code that we can use but not really care about what it's doing behind the scenes. We just need to know at a high level what it's doing. So abstraction gives us a way to handle complexity. You don't need to know, for example, on print, you know, how many hundreds of lines of code are being executed behind the scenes. You just need to know that when you give it a string, it'll put it on the screen. In the Lunar Lander game, you don't need to know what draw lander does. You just need to know that when you call this function, it will draw a lander on the screen in the correct location. So thankfully, you know, 
we have these tools because they give us a way to communicate the behavior of code rather than the specific implementation of that code. If somebody else wants to write a different print function, you could use that one without worrying about it. If we wanted to do a new terabytes to bits function like you did in the previous video, it wouldn't matter, right? Someone could come up with a better way to write that function and we wouldn't have to worry about the underlying details. So when I put it all together, what we are essentially doing is we take big problems, we use functional decomposition to break it down into the smallest possible tasks, and then we give that to programmers and they can build functions that do each of these small tasks. We code each of them one at a time, and then we stop worrying about how the functions work. And now we can think back at a high level of, okay, now I can just use this function and it will do its job, and I don't have to worry about the underlying details. That's the entire lesson. That's why we think functions are so powerful. We can reuse code, we can build code that does a task, and then we never have to worry about it again. And most importantly, we can reuse functions in different applications. So now, once I make that uh, print function, every application can use print and not have to worry about it. Once I can convert bits to terabytes, oh sorry, terabytes to bits, I can give that to other programs, we don't have to worry about it. It's a really powerful tool for managing complexity. So that's all there is. Take care, keep programming, and let us know if you need help. Thanks.